Welcome to uh, the signing day special. I'm Thomas Frank Carr, Sean Fitz, Ryan Snyder here to talk about the class of 2024, the least dramatic class uh, in in quite some time. That has been um, one of the things that these guys have talked about throughout uh, this recruiting process. So over the next roughly hour, we are going to talk about um, just talk about these guys again, recap, it's kind of celebration here, just kind of putting a final bow on this particular recruiting cycle. Obviously, there is still the late signing period, so anything can happen in the future, but this is really the bulk of the class for Penn State football, um, and uh, we're going to get into it. One thing I want to tell everyone off the top of the show is that I- I'm a person that loves to stand on ceremony. I love to do things in the order that we do them. I like to have a process and, and all of those things. Also, I'm a rip the Band-Aid guy- off type guy, and uh, today we're not live because T. Frank messed up. Um, a couple weeks ago, quick story, and I, I apologize for for uh, hogging the start of the show, guys. We're gonna get to you in a second. I have to under I want people to understand that this is not how I like to do stuff because I like to stand on ceremony and have the, the show to talk to everybody. But let's say three weeks ago or four weeks ago, whatever it was, I was watching film, you know, five feet deep in Rutgers review, and that my wife up. says. Yeah. How or when do you want to when do you want to fly for Christmas? And I said, I I don't know. What's a good day? And she just says, Well, what about Wednesday, December twentieth? And I said, Sure, why not? A week later, I went. There's something going on that day, isn't there? So it took a full week for me to realize that I was traveling on the wrong day, the one day I couldn't all year. So I am sorry to everybody who wants to hear to talk about these guys, talk about this class with Ryan and Fitz. It's my fault. You can be mad at me here in the chat. Uh, But we are bringing you this conversation still. So after that two-minute intro about all of that stuff, Ryan, uh, what's the story of the class of 2024 to you? The story of the class, uh, I would say the depth from a positional perspective. I think Sean would agree with that. I think they hit their needs and and that's always easy to say in most classes but i think you can also point back to to many that you know, whatever position it may be you know you you could add in a guy here you could add in a guy there there's really not a spot i look at in this class and say yeah they, they really should have got another player uh, at that position so i think that's always really important because it's it's also a big reason why there wasn't any drama d- down the stretch uh, Penn State got their needs uh, early on. I mean, it's kind of wild that they had pretty much the entire class done in July, and then of course added Jalen Harvey in October, and, and that's really been it. Uh, that it, it's it's been pretty quiet for the most part for the last five months uh, outside of outside of Harvey, and of course they were monitoring some guys, but uh, you know for the most part this this class has been done for quite some time now. So uh, good all around as far as what what they needed to get. Uh, they, I think they added what seven or so top one hundred and fifty ish prospects, which is always good. Uh, and then there's some there's some guys that I think are, are being slept on quite a bit uh, as far as ratings as well. So uh, a good class for Penn State. And uh, we'll, we'll I think it will finish top 15, top 16, something like that. We'll see how things play out because we are tape delayed right now. we got to see what happens tomorrow uh, with some schools. But uh, Penn State, I mean, I think at worst, Michigan's right behind them right now. So maybe Michigan jumps over them, but it, it should be third or fourth in, in the Big Ten. Fitz, what about you? What's the story of this class? Yeah, you look at how the numbers are spread out, and then you look at what Penn State still needs. And obviously, everybody's watching that season saying they they need another receiver. They need another this uh, or that. But, like, you got three receivers, and you've also got maybe Quentin Martin that could possibly be a receiver. So you, you didn't have to make that leap from absolute need to luxury, like, um, because all this was, like, in the boat by October. And then before that, july i guess it would have been so like it was a it was a situation where penn state very little drama as greg mentioned on the show yesterday Derek plaz was the only uh decommit and that's like a lot of penn state fans will say i don't even remember that name because he was in the class for a couple of weeks (laughs) over the summer so i I just think that the way that this came together together uh, a run in the spring and then a little bit of a lull as as happens like that's that's what happens and then the official visits come in and the summer run takes place and then you get down to the official visits in the season i don't i don't do penn state have an official visitor an uncommitted official visitor um through the season ryan i mean that, i'm, I'm just harvey oh, no, no, that? no 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 Jalen was unofficial oh, um he took, his, he took his official in june remember no um uh, AJ Dennis. Dennis. illinois AJ Dennis. yeah Dennis. AJ Dennis. okay that that was that's it like I knew there was one. And I'm, he's registering like Derek Plaza is for a lot of Penn State fans right now. Just <laughs> exactly. 
yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, but little to no drama, and uh, you know, that's good on, on some ends. I mentioned on the show the other day that you know you're you're not in it at the end of the day. You know, for some of these kids that are announcing right now, that can be good and bad. These are some talented kids, but uh, you know, yeah. deciding late in the process, I'm not sure. We don't have data on this, but deciding late in the process, does that always work out? Not always. So. Um, interesting to see what they, they will do from here. Like we, we look back at the, the class last year and chimney was still on the board. Um, and the year before, um, Venga was on the board. So we had an idea of where they were going for February. You look at the way that this class is spread out with numbers and you don't, you don't think they have to splash anywhere to, to mm -hmm. fill a need to, to take a, a late riser that maybe just does not have the tools, but has the athleticism or, or vice versa even. So interesting how this has played out in terms of a numbers perspective because it has left them with very few uh numerical needs in this class yeah i'll give most of my thoughts on the thursday show which is you know coming up if you're watching this live that's coming up tomorrow morning uh where you know i just give uh, break down the class from what i saw from them on film but generally big picture of thought for me and this is be the only thing i'll really get into is is frame I think this this uh, this class has an opportunity to do a lot of special things because they've got a lot of guys that have the potential. Potential doesn't mean it's going to be realized. It doesn't mean that everything on film is going to translate perfectly to the college football level. But, I mean, you look at the offensive line, the defensive line, they got big safeties. Quinton Martin is a unique running back. And then, you know, a guy like Peter Gonzalez at receiver, some of the talent they have throughout the class. There's a lot of guys with big upside and i can't say that I've, I've thought that about every penn state class that i've seen come through here because there have been times where you go well they're taking that guy and he's going to be a good football player but maybe he's not going to be a guy that can be a difference maker there are potential difference makers from ta cunningham all the way to luke reynolds of guys who just have just have so much talent so i think you know you, you look at them 15th 16th wherever they may be i think this class has a chance to outperform that just based on some of that stuff uh and, and we're going to get in go ahead Ryan. And, and i think they have time that's the thing that we don't really think about because we want to know who the early impact guys are who can get on the field right away but you mentioned a couple of guys in there i, I would throw out like egan boyer and garrett sexton yep. who are you know garrett sexton is really highly rated uh, especially with on three he's a top 100 guy um, and Egan Boyer is kind of a similar guy that they're going to have to build up, but there's time there uh, to build up offensive tackles. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Malachi Williams is the guy that like screams that for me because he's right now six, three and a half, close to six, four, two, 15, two, 17 and, and there. And he's not going to play in the big 10 at that, but look at the guys in front of him. He's got time to, to mature time to grow and time to take that year. So Penn state's overall roster health is so much better than it has been in past years. And because of that, you get a chance to develop these guys. You get a chance to not throw them into the fire and that will, I think benefit everybody in the long run. We're going to get into some class superlatives later in the show as well. A lot of, I hope, fun stuff coming up on the show. But one thing I, that is deadly serious is if you're going to play football, you better be prepared on the field. And one of the best ways to prepare yourself is to do everything off the field to maximize your talent. This applies to not only the group that we're going to be talking about, but you, if you're a college football or you're a high school football coach, maybe you're a college football coach and you're watching this. You know, I don't know. Maybe you're, you're, uh, Maybe Ricky Ronnie is is saying hi from Old Dominion or something like that. MMA FX taught by Bruce Lombard here in State College is a video program that you can take with you to your team. If you have a son or a football team that you want to give an edge to on the football field, every split second and movement matters in the game. So train like the best and train with uh, these mixed martial arts techniques that you that Bruce has developed and translated to the game of football specifically. Now there are certain positions this is for receivers uh linebackers and defensive linemen are the major areas where the major groups where you're going to get a lot of this uh translation skill but he also has uh programs and things for offensive linemen so check all that out you can get a free consultation here if you're in state college but the video set i think is the thing that you're going to want to take away from this the only comprehensive hand fighting program video set for football players available anthony zettel you saw there in the uh in the promo stuff he uh and and uh bruce go through all of the de techniques there's 25 techniques 60 drills and four levels of progression so you can get better at this stuff over time and it's not just Penn State football players that have used it Denai Dennis Sutton is a guy who trains with him uh in state college but uh you know a former NFL lineman uh, uh excuse me 
NFL defensive linemen like Daquan Jones, Anthony Zettel, guys like that, and teams like uh, Alabama, Oklahoma, Washington, Virginia Tech, Auburn, Florida. There are a lot of teams that have benefited from Bruce's training. So you can get it, by the way, for 15% off if you use the promo code 15BWI to get 15% off at LombardMMA.com backslash shop. Christmas is just around the corner. This deal is not going to last forever. Hint about when it might end. This would be a great. Uh, this would be a great Christmas present, a stocking stuffer for the uh, the the person in your life that wants to excel at football. So let's get into it. Let's talk about it and talk about the class review of 2024. Best place to start: quarterback. So uh, Ethan Grunkmeyer. I think that we've all talked about him individually, but Fitz, cap us off with a recap. Ethan Grunkmeyer, go. Please. What a lesson in how to follow recruiting these days, because we thought for the longest time it would be Michael Van Buren, and then Penn State, you know, went uh, rolled that rode that roller coaster through the winter and the early spring. Mike Yurcich went out on the road. One of the first things he did when he went out on the road was offer Ethan Grunkmeyer, who, by comparison, had a not very good offer list uh, compared to Michael Van Buren. But watch that ride since then. Uh, Grunkmeyer has ascended like crazy. He really improved between his junior and senior seasons, um, and it showed not only in his numbers, but also in the number of his team, in the numbers his team made on a uh, a trek to the playoffs there uh, for a team that won four games prior to that. So uh, this is a guy that came in uh, strong arm, uh, a lot to like in terms of his improvisational skills, has a lot of the things. And we've talked about this before that the Brad Mandler uh, pupils have had, including Drew Aller, uh, the, the arm angles, the, uh, you know, the, just that whip that they all, they all seem to yeah. have. Um, he's gotten it done. So and he's also become a class leader. He's been a guy that's, uh, you know, been there, for the time, I mean, he, he committed in May and he's kind of been at the forefront of the class, just continues to improve. I'm very excited. I'm going to go down and see him uh, a couple of times in the Under Armour game, uh, watching him practice there to see how he checks in among the elite quarterbacks in the class of 2024. He has gone from Ryan. I know you had the stats somewhere, but he's gone from a, you know, a, a low three or I guess a mid three star to a top 10 quarterback uh, by uh, by on three standards. So excited to see that. Um, very curious to see how this quarterback room shakes out in the next couple of years. Um, you've got Jackson Smollett there, Bo Perbula, of course, behind Drew Aller. But uh, these guys are uh, the, the I think the room is just continues to get healthier. And, and Ethan Grunkmeyer. Uh, probably the second strongest arm in that room. Um, and it's a, it, it'll be exciting to see him develop because I think there's a lot going on for him. Yeah, Ryan, can you give us that that uh, the rise that he's gone on? And then um, one of the things that I know Charles Power talked about last year or uh, earlier this year was seeing all of it translate to the field and making sure that he became the quarterback on the field from a production and win standpoint. How did you view that conversation? Because I know that that was, <laughs> that was one of those things that people got excited about uh, Ethan Grunkmeyer and then didn't want to hear anything about, you know, whether he wins or not. So w- mm-hmm. what's your view of his progression as a, as a player in the class of 24 bit? Well, yeah, the the stat Sean was referring to when he when he when he committed, he was the forty first ranked quarterback in the nation. Now, of course, that was the industry ranking uh, that was back in May. You know, a lot a lot was still kind of you know, being shuffled in, in the ratings. Of course, that was right when uh, camps were really kind of kicking off. I, I always kind of tell people like uh, where they're at the end of the summer, going into the senior year. Like that's usually where it's a, a bit more firm as far as what they'll what they'll end up finished at. But again, forty first ranked quarterback in the country. Now he's number eight in the industry rating. One three actually has him at number seven and, and pretty much at all four sites. Uh, I think pretty much have him top 10. I think rivals has him a little bit lower than that, but either way, I mean, he, he's certainly one of the top dozen or so guys in the country and really just go back to that, to that uh, elite 11 finals uh, and, and what he kind of did there. I mean, only Dylan Riola and Julian Sane were the only two guys that I think, if you look over it, it, at all the, the different recruiting services who were there, that like consistently were rated above them. And of course, you know, they're both five star guys going to Alabama and now Nebraska, which is which is wild to say with Raiola. But yeah, uh, we, we can get into that another day. So, uh, but yeah, as as you were saying, T. Frank, I mean, the mechanics were all on show. You know, that that was there to see when they were out there at the finals. But but how do you take that then? then and then translate it to to when the pads are on and I 
from everything we've seen, he's, he's done a great job with that. Sean, you were mentioning uh, taking his team to another level. I think they went, it was like 11 and three or something like that this season, 11 and four. It was their best season in a decade uh, at Ola Tangi. So that says something there. A uh, little under 4,000 yards passing, I believe it was. 3,000, I forget what it was exactly. I know it was 39 touchdowns. Um, great, great stats. I mean, stats only mean so much, but he had a phenomenal year. So uh, let's let's see how he does uh, when he gets to Penn State. He, he will be in an early enrollee, which is important, especially at quarterback. The other thing that stands out, too, with Ethan is just like he's like a really smart kid, too. Like, man, I, I think a lot of people saw the the academic all Ohio and, and all those kind of things like. He, he's a guy that I think will have no real issues when it, when it comes to film room and, you know, the, the transition to, to the college game. Of course, the speed is the thing that everybody needs to see. And, and that'll, Sean, you're going to get to see that maybe down at Under Armour, at least a little bit of a, a taste of you know, how he transitions to, to having uh, the, those elite defensive players out on the field. But uh, Grunk's got everything you want. And I know, like, obviously, Yurchich has been a uh, – not a popular name yeah, around the around Penn State yeah. circles over the last six weeks, but you got to give him a lot of credit on this one because because he had a, he, he played a big role in, in getting Grunkmeyer here. He knew quarterbacks. Uh, if there's one he thing, you look scout at, him for sure. Yeah, if he he could pick a guy that knew from from a mental perspective. I feel like every quarterback that he's targeted, Jackson Small is a part of this too. That just you look at that guy and you go, he can play football from the neck up and has a lot of talent from a processing and delivering standpoint because you know traits are great but from that position if you can't if you can't decipher the puzzle then you can't really play and uh, and I thought that you know for for all the things as you just pointed out one of the things he did was he could identify quarterbacks and identify him pretty early too uh want to move on though to the running back position we talked about Quentin Martin off the top the importance of landing Quentin Martin I think fits we, we've kind of forgotten this he was a guy that you had to get. How important was he to this class to land him uh, to kind of secure some of the higher end talent early on in the process? Well, very important when you look at what Penn State number one needs right now, and that's offensive skill players that can put points on the board. And he's a guy that's been able to do that um, as a running back. He just won a state championship, a second state championship for Bell Vernon. Um, and he, he did it as a running back, as a receiver, and as a decoy. And uh, I think that's probably going to be something that helps him out when he learns how to, you know, fit into this room with Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, um, yeah. et cetera. And uh, it's going to be a, a big jump for him. But at the same time, I think he's athletic enough to do it. Um, just like all around, like this is one of those guys that you've been tracking since he was a freshman. Um, just an all around athlete, uh, very good speed. I'm very curious to see what happens when they focus in on one position, one side of the ball, that kind of stuff, and how what kind of jumps that he can make. Because it's interesting to see him learn to move. And uh, what I mean by that is he was in camp, and he just looked like that athlete that was going through it out athleting everyone. He yeah. actually put on the uh, the vest, uh, the, the GPS vest, and ran faster than Corey Smith, who we're going to talk about here in a second. Corey Smith ran a 4-4. Um, and I believe Quentin Martin was in the four fives, but his top speed was faster. Like that tells you that there is like more to cultivate there, which is a good thing because he's, you know, a, a pretty good product already. So yeah. I'm excited to see what he can do. I know everyone wants to talk about him as a potential receiver. I personally would love to see it. Um, yeah. you look at what he brings to the table outside and that's great queuing up of those highlights, uh, by the way, um, when he learns to run routes, I think he can be maybe the best receiver in this class, which is crazy to think about. So um, uh, endless possibilities. He's got a new offensive coordinator, which he should be excited to, uh, to, to be in this offense because it will give him a chance to maybe showcase those skills a little bit, uh, a little bit more and a little bit more in a wide ranging array of uh, a, array of threatening positions. So I'm excited to see Quentin Martin take the next step. I think that he could play right away, but at the same time, he's got those two guys in front of him who I think are going to take most of the snaps next year. So very curious to see how they use him right off the bat. Uh, I believe Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, he'll be here for the spring. So um, mm -hmm. he's going to start at running back, um, but I would not be shocked if they try to play around with him a little bit and see what he can bring to the table as a, as a slot guy. Yeah, Ryan, what's the what's Quinton's view on that kind of stuff? Obviously, he's been doing it in high school. Um, if you know that, and then you know, secondarily, how, what what's your view of you know how he fits into the the room going forward for Penn State? Like Fitz was just talking about. Yeah, well, when he committed, he he said you know down to do whatever's best on the team, get on the field, which is what what you'd expect him to say. Uh, he does. He is certainly 
made it clear that you know, he wants to play running back and Penn State wants him as a running back. And that's I don't have any doubts that I think long term that'll be the case. But when you're a talented freshman going into a, a new offense with a new off or a new offensive coordinator uh, and one of the more highly talented guys like, yeah, you're, you're going to get out there and get in the slot or something like that. If Colton Necky wants to get you on the field. I mean, I don't I don't see why you'd be like, no, nah, I'd rather just hang out here and you know, watch these guys. Like, I, I'll keep my red shirt. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I, he's got to be excited w- with that move. And, and I, I think it'll be really fun. Maybe even the blue white game. We get a little taste of, of what could be what could be coming or although I wouldn't be shocked if they, they, they hold that out, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, they're definitely going to want to get him on the field, um, you know, out in that blue white game. But uh, look, I, he's had incredible stats forever. And the one thing that pops out, well, let me give his career stats. It was 3,863 yards rushing over his career, 1,438 yards receiving, you know, so that's over. What is that? Like 5,200 yards or so 82 touchdowns for his career. The thing that always kind of stands out to me, and I was having a talk with Charles Power about this the other day, is he had like 730, 740 or so receiving yards and 11 receiving touchdowns this year. Like, guys, that's better than a lot of wide receivers who are ranked in the top 300 uh, for, for this class. And that's, you know, we're just talking receiving. Of course, he had yeah. over 1,000 yards rushing as well. So uh, there's no doubt that he can do it with his hands and, and you know, get him in space and, and see what happens. So uh, I wouldn't be shocked at all if if I'm looking at – offensive guys in this class who can get out there and and make some sort of an impact probably not, obviously he's not going to start but above those guys but could he play a couple hundred snaps and not redshirt wouldn't surprise me one bit and of course the the special teams aspect of it the kick return aspect is another thing that i, I just got bored watching him return 75 80 90 yard 100 yard touchdown right. like, i'm going to fast forward through some of these because i want to get to see him play his position well, yeah remember last year sean i went out there and the one time i drove all all the way out there to watch him play uh, he was the decoy the whole game, but he had like a 95 yard putt return that, that I felt like kind of saved the day as far as, you know, gathering film and really getting to see him out in the open field and watch him run. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's my one fun Quentin Martin story. Fortunately, they came to Cumberland Valley for two state championships. So we got to watch him up close, uh, a little closer to home. That that's your thing though. Like you go to a yeah. game and they just shut, shut the playbook. Oh, down. don't get me started. Iowa. I'll never Iowa. forget Smolik. Like Smolik throws for like 500 yards. I'm like, Sean, let's go to Iowa and watch Smolik. And then he threw for like 110. And they had some crazy defense. And his only touchdown was a one yard sneak. Okay. Next up. Very important clarification. You went to Iowa. Let's yes. had nothing uh, yes. to do with that. Yeah. Hey, I, I we'll, we'll talk about I know. that. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed Des Moines. Although I couldn't get an Uber. Thank you to the Smolik family for giving me a ride back to the hotel. You know, we've talked so much about Quentin Martin. Can he, who can solve the Penn State receiver issue? Is it Quentin Martin? Uh, something I was pretty impressed by. Uh, Corey Smith here. We're going to talk about him next. A lot of receiving uh, highlights here on his senior film. I know that I think an injury was a part of this. Fits in his senior season. A lot of these were come from a playoff game. Uh, he's more of a traditional running back. Is that fair to say? Uh, compared to maybe Martin, who has all that uh, versatility skill. This is a guy who's going to come in and be a quality Penn State running back. I think so. I, I thought so more so before this the, the the senior highlights came out. And you're right, he missed most of his senior season uh, with an injury. Was able to come back for the playoffs and and was productive there. And that's kind of when he did the most stuff away from being a running back. So like I was I was all on board with the running back stuff before this, and now I'm like, hey, this guy this guy might be the receiver. Probably not. But um, he does a lot of really good things. Uh, I mentioned that 4-4 off the top. Um, he can run really well. He's uh, he's shifty as well. His junior film as a running back uh, among the best in the country in terms of like just pure highlights. Um, so it was exciting to see him come back and, and be able to finish off his senior season strong. Um, but yeah, he's he did a really nice job of adapting to the different um, – demands and because he came back when he did they put him all around they put him as a running back they put him as a receiver and you know really tried to maximize what they were able to do and expand that offense and i think that's probably what's exciting about both of these guys is you're you're able to expand what you're able to do because it's not just a you're not just a one cut guy uh getting up on the uh you know just getting up and going so it's uh it, it, it's fun to watch his development it's fun to watch him you know come in and camp a couple of times last summer um he's a fun he's a fun player to watch uh, penn state went into wisconsin this year for the first time in forever and pulled out three guys so that's Certainly, if you're talking about the themes of this class, one of the upsets of this class, but very talented player, uh, another good running back class, and they've stacked them up. I'm very curious to see how close these two guys are uh, to Cam Wallace and to London Montgomery from the last cycle. 
T- yeah. T- I mean, one thing I'll jump into, he had 287 yards rushing on 33 carries and one touchdown uh, in those four games that he got in. I, I don't have his receiving stats. I'm, I'm sure he, he, you know, he had some decent stats receiving, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a great bounce back for Corey Smith. I wish we could have got to watch him more, but uh, who knows? Maybe he'll be the one that because we didn't get to watch him a whole lot in his senior year that, you know, ends up being the one who kind of flashes early on and surprises people. Yeah, certainly has, as you guys mentioned, the speed and and some of the skills you would want in this class. Um, speaking of, let's get to that position. Let's just get dive into the receiver position. Ryan, want to come back to you. Which one of these guys do you think uh, stands out the most that you want to start with as the headliner of the group? Uh, I mean, I think Tyson, I mean, if you're looking, uh, listen, the, the question everybody wants is which one of the three receivers could get on the field the earliest, right? I think that's that's where we're what we're talking about here. Well, obviously, Josiah Brown tears his ACL. He, his spring is is going to be all about rehab, and you know, hopefully, he can get back and uh, be a hundred percent for the fall. I think Peter Gonzalez. I think he would red. I mean, he he seems like more of a red shirt guy. And and the other thing too is like the Central Catholic guys aren't allowed to enroll early, so he and Specka won't be able to get here until May or June. That's got to hurt him there. And then, of course, Tysier Denmark won't be here until the summer either. So I think those are three things like those those kind of factors. I, I'm not seeing any of these guys are going to pop out and end up, you know, playing in eight games next year. Maybe one of them will. If I had to pick one, I think, Sean, you would agree. Tysier is the one that kind of flashes, has the the you know the, the quick little bursts and those little things that you want to see that that can you know maybe make some chunk plays. But it's not going to be easy for any of these three guys uh, to to come. Well, again, Josiah, of course, injured. He will be here early. But those other two, you know, for them to not get here until the summer, it's going to be really hard for them to get on the field right away. I would agree with that. And and I think that Ty Sears just got that that pure talent like we talked about with we talked about with Jahan. And I don't want to compare uh, Dot, uh, Dotson and, and Denmark, but like you, a lot of the same things that we said, I was, is this kid fast enough? I, I mean, Denmark is not a world-class sprinter, like, but he is insanely quick in and out of breaks like Jahan was. Uh, does he have the hands? I don't know. We'll see. Um, but th- there's a lot of the same questions that we had for those, uh, for, for Jahan, we have for, for Ty Sear. So um, if he's able to do everything that he needs to do to, to get here and to develop and to like st- step on right away, he would be my pick, but like I, I don't think you're leaning on any of these guys to go out there and be a third or fourth receiver for this team. Um, I I just don't think it's in the cards. I don't think that the the this particular set, and of course Josiah Brown being out, you know that really stinks. I don't know that he would have done it anyway, but mm-hmm. I don't think this particular set gives you the early impact type vibes. Um, and I think that's why you see the activity in the portal right now. Yeah, it's also as much as you can uh, be an early contributor receiver. It's hard to be a problem solver at receiver. Like we've seen guys that come in and been good and been like, oh, excited for the future for Penn State fans. But you haven't really seen anybody who's come in and dominated those again, those five star guys, those guys that have the obvious talent. Penn State is still those are elusive for them. And I would say. Uh, this class kind of leads into that, but getting to the upside guys, where do you gauge Peter Gonzalez and his video game numbers, Ryan? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, look, he's in a good, he was in an offense that was able to maximize him on chunk plays, right? I mean, just just look at these highlights. (laughs) He's able to run past a lot of guys, had a great quarterback that could get on the ball. Uh, What that means long-term is, is kind of hard to say. I mean, he had a fantastic year. It was great for him to get back from the injury of course, before he even got to his senior year, uh, you know, him proving his, his, you know, that he had the speed that he was another guy that we, everybody was wondering, you know, how fast is he, especially coming off an ACL tear uh, the, the previous, I think it was what, it, after his sophomore year, going into junior year. Uh, so it would have been pretty much uh, almost two years ago, but uh, yeah. he certainly proved that ran great in hundred meter, ran great up at Penn state. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to like there, but again, I, I just come back to, he's not going to be here in the spring and that's, and that's massive. If you're going to like, yeah, Penn state's wide receiver room needs, needs work, but those guys should keep getting better in the spring too. So to, to come in as a freshman in the summer and, and try and, uh, you know, take over or win, you know, fourth or fifth guy, it's just, it's just not going to be easy to do, but, but Peter's got a lot of potential. Um, and, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, he's got the size and the frame and he's got good hands. There's, there's a lot to like there. I'm curious to see how he does and how quickly he can get on the field. 
Uh, aside from that, Fitz, just what are your thoughts on on Peter and his progress from you know that injury to where he is now? And he was probably one of the classic heartwarming stories of the guy. We just rewinding to the summer, he had to come and earn his Penn State offer, from what I remember, right? That's right. Yeah, Penn State was sort of reinvigorated their interest in him last spring when he was running track, and he was right around that eleven second mark. Which he's a he's a bigger kid, so for him to be at that speed level, there's something there. And they brought him in for camp, and he is was still sort of I don't want to say getting over the knee injury, but he wasn't a full participant because of it. He actually, uh, if I recall correctly, participated a little too much. The coaches were like, "Hey." back off here a second. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, he was able to test. Well, he, he proved that he had the athleticism, uh, to back up what he was doing on the track. And that was good. The the tape is interesting because it's a lot of, Hey, just beat this guy, like run past this guy. We'll yeah. throw it down there and go with it. So I'm very curious what his, his route tree looks like and how much he's going to have to learn to actually play receiver, the nuances of, of running a route, the nuances of getting off the line of scrimmage. Uh, just the, the little things like that are, th are things that I think will probably keep him in a red shirt, um, as he develops that that aspect of the position, because he's I, I, it, it's it's so weird to look at it because you look at those numbers and you think that this might be a proven product. But he's, I think, pretty raw. He's going to have to polish quite a bit when he gets to Penn State. For sure. Uh, we are 31 minutes through the show and we have gone through three positions, I think. So uh, <laughs> doing an excellent job pacing the show uh, at captain. I am an unassailable captain hey, of the show. And I'm going to cut you off. And just one thing, like uh, <laughs> just kind of looking at Peter's numbers, like the yeah. one, the, the one other numbers, or there's two other numbers from that camp. You know, we run a four, five, five, which was really good. Uh, I remember that stood out, but he also ran a four, one, five shuttle at that camp. Very good. Yep. And he had a 32, foot triple broad which i mean there aren't too many guys out there doing 32 foot triple broads so just want to like the explosiveness and yeah, the athleticism and, is there yeah 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 i mean yeah. that that was i i thought he could run like a four five four six forty it was those other numbers that was like oh wow that 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 i didn't see coming yeah, yeah there, there were there were flashes of it when he was coming back from his acl injury his junior season where you go is this guy fast because he looks explosive on one leg and then you know we we've kind of see that reveal in his senior season um if you want to get more information on these guys you want to get more of the down into the weeds and and by the way talk to us which i i feel like i'm uh, ignoring everybody in the chat because we're recorded today and i still feel bad about that but you can still talk to us over at bluewhiteillustrated.com signing day sale we're going to be extending it you know Today is signing day. You're watching this at the end of the day, but this is going to be extended until tomorrow. $54.99 for a year of access to the good stuff. Inside information, scoop, all of the things. Low drama this year, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be next year. And if you got a year of access, you're going to get the 2025 class as well. So sign up right now and get all those goodies for $55 for one year year um we got to get through a couple of these positions pretty quickly luke reynolds as much as it is he's elite it is kind of uh unassailably great uh from a prospect standpoint didn't start that way did it ryan no uh barely a top 1000 recruit i think when he committed it was like 960 i don't remember the exact number it was somewhere between 950 and a thousand it was uh very very low um but now he's what <laughs> it's top 50 on pretty much every site top three tight end everywhere yeah, had a fantastic season cheshire uh led his team you know which is you don't always see a, a tight end leading his team in receptions but you know, we finished with 48 catches 400 or excuse me 754 yards eight touchdowns uh but the the thing that like with luke was just how what's the, how did charles put it like his Oh, darn it, I'm forgetting the way he explained it to me, and I don't want to do him not justice, but just I just we'll just say this. His his Elite 11 performance absolutely grabbed everybody's attention. Just his consistency in all of his routes, his hands, all those little things. I mean, he was a tight end out there, and a lot of people were talking about how he was just one of the best receivers there uh, altogether. And there was quite a few, you know, talented guys out there for the all 22. So uh his his elite, just like Grunkmeyer, his Elite 11. Uh, finals performance uh, really kind of put him on the map and he's just steadily been moving up ever since. Fitz, this is a guy where Penn State had the opportunity to go after a couple of other tight ends or they were talking to a couple other tight ends, but it turned out they didn't really need any of those top guys because Reynolds became one of them. It, it, do I remember that correctly? This was probably the best decision that they made in terms of taking a guy this class because you look at Reynolds and Reynolds when he was a junior was a quarterback and 
he came to camp and he tested really, really well. He tested sort of in line with what Penn State has gotten at tight end uh, in the last couple cycles. Um, and uh, there was a lot to like there, but yet he really hadn't played tight end. So this was a projection when they took him back in, I think, late March. Um, and it was it was good. I remember writing right after that that this kid was the lowest ranked player in the class. And I don't think he's going to stay there very long. Uh, just because of the way that he moved, the way that he seemed to understand where he needed to be. And if you look at his senior film, he's still coming along in that. He's finding spots in the zone. He's finding he's not just running to a spot because that's where the, the route tree says for him to end up. He's finding spots in the zone. He's got a really smart quarterback in Dante Reno who's going to South Carolina as well. But there's just so much to like about the way that he plays football. Like there's so much to like about him knowing the right spots to be in, him sort of feeling the distance and spacing between the receiver, him and the receiver on the outside running routes and things like that. And it's been really cool to watch him pick that up. And as he's done so, he's gone right up the rankings and his athleticism is up there. His, uh, you know, his competitiveness, uh, we talked about the elite 11, but the elite 11 at state college, he was also there just like taking every rep, doing everything possible. And Penn state is tickled that he's stuck. And by the way, he's stuck with, um, they had the um, the the camp, not the camp, but the showcases up in the Northeast during the evaluation period. Alabama came through and offered him. A couple other schools came through and offered him. He never posted those, never wanted to do anything else because he wanted to go to Penn State. And I think that that says something about him as a prospect as well. Let's get into the offensive line because I think this is, to me, this is the most fascinating group uh, that that uh, has been assembled in this class of 2024. And that's saying something considering the defensive line, which we'll get to in a little bit. Ryan, where do you want to start with the, the offensive line in this group of uh, super big? You got to start a tackle. Athletes? You got to start a tackle. I mean, that was the thing that that Penn State has done a very good job over the years of getting guys who are versatile. You know, guys who can start outside, bump down in. You know, that that's always how many times has James Franklin James Franklin brought that up? You know, he he wants he wants guys who are, are kind of mobile uh, on the offensive line. But I think they've really realized they, they need true offensive tackles and, and they went out and got two guys who are absolute. No doubt about it. They're going to play offensive tackle in Garrett Sexton and, and Egan Boyer. So I, I think Sexton has all the potential of the world. Charles obviously loves him. He has him as a top 100 prospect. It's all developmental there. You know, let, let's let's be honest. He, he has still a lot of work to do. He's only played offensive tackle for two years. He, he was another guy who was a quarterback. <laughs> I can't imagine. I would love to have seen him a quarterback, by the way. I'd like to get some of that JV film or whatever it was when he was a quarterback. But I don't um, think he was that big at that point. But <laughs> oh, he wasn't that big uh, size-wise, no. but height-wise, he was still, I believe, you know, six yeah, four. Yeah, he's still six, six, six. Six. Like, Yeah, like that, yeah. Uh, but yeah, of course. I mean, a lot of a lot of he's he's going to need time. And as Sean kind of hit up at the start of the show, I mean, both he and Boyer will need time. Um, but but I mean, there's no doubt about it when when you're looking at just kind of his measurables and and what what. NFL teams covet. I mean, really, whatever, whatever major college team covets too. I mean, he's got all those little uh, intangibles when it comes to testing numbers and things like that. So, uh, give him a year or two with Trout. Let's see how how things work out. But he's one of the more athletic players you'll find at uh, at his size. And of course, I mean, he's added. What did he add, Sean? Was it like seventy plus pounds over like a year and a half or something like that? It was. It was something well along those lines, and it was just uh, you could you could see him when he came here for camp in the summer. You could see like the the mass that he had added and the fact that he was still learning to play with it. And I think he still is learning to play with it, but at the same time, like you put on his film every week this year and he got better and better and better. And he's learning to play the position. He's learning like the offensive lineman mentality. And if he can put that all together, the ranking seems right. I mean, I, <laughs> I've said this before. I, I think he's probably a little high, but that's, that's like a uh, shooting for the moon type projection that could hit if everything goes right. Yeah, I, I I gush about him every time he comes up. So I'll I'll save that for later. And let's, let's just say, him. like, even Boyer is not like yeah. in Penn State's eyes, he's not that far off from Sexton. Like, they're they're Egan Boyer is probably one of the more underrated guys in the class. Now, at, at the, with that said, like Egan hasn't put out any new film, <laughs> really. Right. I mean, I think, this is like thirty seconds worth of film yeah. we got here. Yeah, there, there's. I, I talked to him the other week, and uh, he was like, "Nah, I, I don't need to. I'm not recruited anymore. I don't need." I don't need to Dude, do it. No, hated the recruiting process. He hated that process. I remember talking to him when he committed. He's like, yeah, I, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to get this over with and just like not deal with this anymore. And uh, yeah, and he wants to work in NASCAR. So it's like everything is <laughs> everything about this kid I just love. 
let's let's move on to Cooper. Not to ignore him, uh, but Cooper Cousins. We have yet to talk about the leader, one of the leaders of this class, the guy that committed before anybody else. Uh, Ryan, wh- how what have you gotten to know about Cooper Cousins over the last year and a half, almost two years now? Everybody loves him. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, whenever I whenever I talk to other commits about. Hey, what was your weekend like uh, Penn State like this past, you know, what was it two weeks ago? They all got together. I mean, like Cooper seems to be life of the party is like the wrong way to put it. And that, 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 may, that may, people might think the wrong thing if I say that. But like he's just he's just one of those guys that, that seems to be a lot of fun and, and all of his teammates love. And um, but I mean, heck, let, let's talk to him about it. Let's talk about him as a player, because. Sean and I have been talking about this for the longest time, man. Like when he dropped out of the on 300, like Sean, I might as well just throw it to you. Cause I know you were so, you were not happy with that. And, and it, and look, look what's happened ever since. I mean, he jumped back in, he's moved up steadily ever since and, and is now what the, the fourth ranked player in Penn state's class. But if he ends up being a center, like he's, I think the best center in the, in this class, I don't really think there's any doubting that, but yeah. I mean, he's, he's got the potential to truly play all three positions on the offensive line and, wouldn't be surprised if they even give him a shot at tackle. Yeah, he likes putting people on the ground. It's uh, it's so much fun to watch his highlights, and he's got the size to back it up. And he's you know he's a six six, uh, three ten right now. He's got the length to play tackle if he's going to you know if they're going to start him there in the spring, which I expect them to do. But yeah, as a center, I mean, this is a guy that's sort of been preparing to play center at Penn State since before he got his offer. And this is a kid that's wanted to enroll at Penn State since he committed, uh, which was uh, almost two years ago at this point. So uh, it's been really cool to watch him mature. It's been really cool to watch him sort of grow up and and embrace the fact that this guy could be one of the few guys that actually contributes early as an offensive lineman. And, you know, we're getting closer and closer to that every year because these guys are coming in so far more yeah. developed. But like this is a guy that you could could have dropped in the 2013 class or the 2023 class. And would have really thought nothing of it. You know, he's uh, he's he's a really good player. Like he's one of my favorites in the class for a reason, just because he's versatile, just because he's like we say low maintenance. He's no maintenance at all. Like he (laughs) yeah, like he'd be the guy that that, that would say, hey, don't don't waste your time coming to recruit me. Go recruit this other guy because I'm I'm good to go. Like we you can have spaghetti in on the night. I don't know. Uh, But uh, no, Cooper Cousins is is one of my favorite prospects in in the in the class in the entire class actually um and it's been really fun to watch him sort of grow mature and ryan to your point yeah when he dropped in those rankings there was really nothing (laughs) that you could look at and say you could justify why he dropped so we got some fresh film on him we got some fresh testing numbers on him and he's steadily moved up so excited to see him take that next step um if penn if he's penn state's center of the future i think penn state's in pretty good hands and just Final to clarify, two. like he was T Frank, real quick, like he was like 280 at the time you know, when he did drop out, and uh, which obviously was too low. Of course, he's he's much higher now, but and he he dropped out just because others kind of moved in, and it was a lot of you know a lot of flexibility in the spring, as I kind of mentioned earlier. That that's always a, a point in the year where you see a lot of guys move around, but no doubt about it. I mean, he's he's definitely the best offensive lineman in this class. And I think he broke Drew Hartlob's pro- program record for most camps attended. Um, so good for him. He's probably <laughs> going to be wall somewhere. I mean, that's a, that's a cheat code. I, I've been saying watching him develop at camps, that's a cheat code that you get to work with your offensive line coach for like two straight years. Um, a couple guys, just to, to name them, Donovan Harbor, Caleb Brewer, also in this class on the offensive line. Interior guys, flexibility with Caleb Brewer, a guy that can play a bunch of different positions, I think. And then Donovan Harbor, a guy that, uh, from a from a standpoint of the recruiting process, high as a, as a sophomore, took a step back as a junior. And then this past season, um, I, I do want to get a quick thought, Ryan, on, on where you think he landed uh, as a senior? Well, I mean, the, the big thing is he's really just kind of fluctuated size wise, and it yeah. looks like he's starting to, to dip back down weight wise. I mean, as a sophomore, before he added a bunch of weight, I mean, he he moved incredibly well for a guy his size. And then, as you see uh, in that graphic there, I mean, three twenty. I think at one point, man, he was like three thirty. I think Sean. I don't. I think I'm I'm right with yeah, that. I think one of his visits, he came in around that size, but um. But yeah, anyway, I mean, he, he from just recent pictures and, and talks with people, he does seem to be dipping back down. And I think Penn State certainly wants him to have size, but maybe maybe get a little bit closer to that 300 mark. Uh, so he's able to, to, to move really well. Um, you know, yeah. once he's able to get here. Go ahead, Sean. You, you look at this guy and I saw him like I was on the fence about Harbor um, the, when they took him and all that kind of stuff, just because the, the weight doesn't look good and things like that. But saw him at the mini camp 
and his weight is, you know, is still, I think, 320 at that point, 325. But the way that he moved his feet, like there is something under there, like the when they strip that down and then build it back up, there's something under there to work with in terms of being incredibly light on his feet for an interior offensive lineman. Um, so it's to me, it's boom or bust um, yeah. because he is a guy that has a lot of the tools. And if he can focus and if he can figure out everything that he needs to from a nutrition and a strength status, like that's a guy that can play some football at, in the big Ten, at the Big Ten level just because his feet are so much lighter than you would think just by looking at him. Yeah, it, it's just an interesting and deep offensive line class. I'm excited to see what they're able to do at the next level because there's a lot of potential. Such, and such a lot variety of... there. Like, yes. it's, it, I don't know that we've seen a class that are everybody is more different than the last. It's it's really pretty crazy. So hey, real quick, our... just before we move, I, mean, we, I do want to just hit on Brewer a little bit. Like, Brewer came up and had a, had a really pretty good camp this summer. I mean, he put up some numbers that, that really kind of impressed me. I mean, he ran a 4-6 shuttle. At like three hundred pounds, like yeah. that's I mean, well, that's the time. Excuse me, he wasn't like three hundred times. He was like three two eighty five, three seventy, three seventy five ish. Because right now he's up to like two ninety, I believe. I think he's I think he's added some weight. But but here's here's the other thing to note: like he's he's going back to wrestling. We thought he was going to enroll early. He's not. He's going to wrestle now, which is that that's kind of out there publicly. Uh, really excited to see how he does uh, there because last year he was twenty four and two as a wrestler. Uh, and then had to get wrist surgery, I believe it was, and wasn't able to participate in the postseason. So, I mean, obviously, he's wrestled his whole life. He knows how to use leverage. That's really important. Uh, get just kind of curious to see how he does on the map this year and then transitions when he gets up here. Uh, most of these guys are all going to need time. I mean, Cooper would be the only one that I think, you know, could could maybe contribute somewhat early. Right. Um, but there's no doubt, like, when you look at some of the, his, his testing numbers, I mean, sub 5, 40, I mean, there's a lot of things there that were pretty impressive uh, with uh, Caleb Brewer. There's something in the water and why I'm missing for sure, because he's a unit. He and Javen, you know, cut from a similar cloth in that terms of you watch them walk around and that like they are built uh, really, really well. He was a tight end for them. He yeah. was their tight end at one point. I don't know. The water, I don't, the water makes you run block too. They don't, they don't pass <laughs> block around there. So that'll be something to to develop here is every yeah. time they take a Y missing kid, we're going to say the same thing. Uh, Betty can run block. Uh, it's going to be a work in progress to learn how to, to actually play the, the full facet of offensive line. Yeah. Uh, so the defensive line, speaking of depth of body types and interesting players, um, Fitz, I do want to come back to you on this one. Where do you start when you start thinking about this defensive line group that Dion Barnes put together in his first class? I start with Liam Andrews, as I usually do. Um, we, we know that I'm a big fan of his, uh, maybe Penn State's best offensive line commit as well. Um, he, he's a really, really good player, just all around um, aggressive. And he wants to play on the defense, which you, you give him that opportunity to do so. Um, he just does everything so well. And I believe he just, uh, we just heard he's, he's using Bruce's, uh, MMA mm -hmm. yes. program as well. So hey, there's, that's a nice little pitch right there, but, uh, aggressive, uh, Ryan and I, I think fell in love with this guy, uh, the, at camp, uh, before his junior year, he was an offensive yeah. lineman and he just bullied kids, just absolutely bullied kids. Like I talked about with, uh, with Cooper fitting in with the group ahead of him, you could have thrown Liam Andrews in with Landon Tangwall and like, you wouldn't have no, it wouldn't have skipped a beat. So, um, this is a guy that, uh, provides you something on both sides of the ball. Uh, I think he's going to be a very, very good defensive tackle for Penn state. He, I'm watching this film today. It was, I have watched a lot of film like you guys have. This is the first time I was like a little bit, He's a little frightening sometimes when he comes off the ball. Like I got actual like, oh my God, that's that's a little bit inti like intimidating sitting here watching it on screen. So that's a really impressive thing from a defensive lineman. Uh, Ryan, the other guys in the class, obviously he he's the the guy that can change the the narrative about Penn State and defensive tackles. Uh, but there's a lot of guys here that have high upside. Uh, what do you think about the other defensive tackles in this group? Yeah, Gilliam is is certainly a guy we've talked about a lot, and DeAndre Cook, of course. Uh, I, both of those guys kind of sit towards the bottom of the rankings. Sean, we've talked about uh, we've talked about seeing those both at um, what was it? Oh, Under Armour camp uh, back in what was it April or May? I mean, Cook was certainly the guy who flashed a good bit that day, but you know, Gilliam was also working as a defensive end. I mean, Gilliam is certainly going to be. Uh, an interior guy I expect moving forward. There was talk at one point he kind of wanted to play edge, but I, I expect him to be an interior guy. And, you know, I just talked to Quits Orchard coach uh, John Kelly the other day, just just couldn't couldn't speak more highly of, you know, his motor and his work ethic and all those little things. And, uh, you know, I think the, the whole 
the thing with Gilliam, right? We talked about so many times. It's just if he was two more, <laughs> two more inches taller, a little bit bigger, uh, he probably would have been a much more highly recruited guy. So uh, I think I think there's a ton of potential with him. You know, Cook. I haven't learned a ton about this season, Sean. Have you been able to find much on Cook? It's been it's been hard for me to find anything on friendship really yeah he's been playing all over the line um and he's he's had a productive year that's a really like big and talented defensive line uh bryce jenkins in the middle there uh dylan stewart on the edge dylan stewart was uh is a five-star guy that's gonna i guess go to south carolina still um but uh no it's a situation where he's sharing sharing numbers and sharing snaps and things like that to me uh, gilliam is the guy that's got the high floor that's probably going to play a little bit sooner cook is the guy with that the the higher ceiling that if he can transfer that size and that athleticism into something, he's going to be a guy that would be like a, a, like a draftable guy eventually. So I'm very curious to see where these paths diverge and where they come back together because Gilliam, I think is a guy that can play probably his second year in the program and uh, you know, have some success in doing it. He's got some really good athleticism that I probably didn't see coming up. I keep mentioning that mini camp freaking love that mini camp uh, at the end of July. Uh, yeah. number one because there's nobody else there and i was just uh was able to get up close and personal but to watch him jump around to watch him do his thing um testing numbers gilliam i'm talking about he had some pop he looked like a volleyball guy jumping around there compared to uh to these other football guys so i'm excited to see him I'm, I'm it's a guy that i'm higher on after seeing in person we had some questions about his uh his frame and things like that but uh he seems to be heading in the right direction he went to uh quince orchard teamed up with jalen harvey and that's uh it's a heck of a defensive line right there yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's shift quickly to Harvey and just talk about those two guys because I find them super interesting. They they look a little bit similar on film um, just from a build perspective, but uh, Jalen Harvey, Ryan, uh, probably the most elusive in this class. He took the longest to decide. How did that recruiting story go? Well, just real quick, we do have to mention T.A. Cunningham, too. I don't want to forget him on the I, defensive line because he I did play say, this year. We're so, that's why I said we're going okay. to come back to him. Right. Don't worry. Right. We yeah. can't, we, we've made every player so far. I just don't want to make sure we don't we don't skip someone. Uh, but yeah, the Jalen's story is, I think, was probably the most followed recruitment this year. I mean, Quentin Martin, to some degree, in the beginning, he, he committed pretty early. But once we got to the summer, and uh, I think Jalen Harvey's recruitment was probably something we talked about more than more than really any other in this class, of course, was very close to committing after his official visit in the beginning of June. Multiple decision dates didn't happen. Ends up deciding he's going to take unofficial visits in the fall. Maryland gets one. USC gets one. Penn State gets him back on campus then uh, for the whiteout game. And what he took what, another three, four weeks and, and then finally uh, announced for Penn State. So uh, they, they finally got him. It felt like it was it was taken. I, I, I thought I that was one sounds so easy in this uh, the 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, uh, I thought it was going to I thought it was going to get away from him, man. There was there was more points every week from people on the sh on the show. Oh, man, that was crazy. But. We thought it was going to be over in, well, for, I think we thought it was going to be over in April. And then we thought it was going to be over in June. And then we thought it might be over at the Lash Bash. And then, yeah. Hey, they got him across the line. That's what matters. They did. Um, one thing you got to get across the line in your travel plans for the holiday seasons. And if you want to go to things and do stuff with your time off, just a random rant here. I'm not a person that likes to sit around and do nothing in my off time. I work really hard all the time. And then when I want to, I want to live my life instead of just sitting on the couch, go to events. I don't ever get there, though, uh, and I need to with the Game Time app. Game Time is uh, an app you can download on your phone and find uh, things to do. Find those T. Frank things to do where you can go out and, and see shows, games, the Peach Bowl. You know, you can check out tickets to the Peach Bowl. They have flash sales and, of course, easy to find and buy tickets for every event in your area and places you may want to go. And you get an image of the seat that you're going to purchase as well. Lowest prices guaranteed, even cancellation protection uh, on the tickets. So GameTime.co, download the GameTime app and a uh, special thing, when you use the promo code BWI, when you download the app, you can get $20 off your first purchase. So if you're going to a game with a friend, you buy tickets together, you get $20 off. Terms apply to that. GameTime.co is the website, but download the GameTime app. Thanks again to GameTime for being a part of the show. I do want to get to the rest of the class. Uh, we talked about Malachi Williams a little bit earlier, so I want to get to T.A. Cunningham. Um, this is a story that probably is a, maybe even a movie at a certain point based on some of the, the things I've heard or the, the, the stuff that, uh, you know, the movement he's had th throughout the country. So Fitz, what is, what is Penn State getting in T.A. Cunningham? You're muted. 
T.A. Uh, burst onto the scene as a young player, and his frame is undeniable. Six, six and a half, 275. He's always been bigger than everyone else. And then he had to have a high school football career, which took him to from Georgia to California to Florida, back to Georgia. Everybody got that? Okay. So he hasn't played much football. There ha- He went to California. He was ruled ineligible. He did not play much um, his junior year, I believe it was. Um, then he came back and was supposed to go to Miami Central, did not go to Miami Central, went back home with his mother uh, to Grayson, uh, did not play there. Um, and I think that, I mean, this is a this is a shot in the dark for Penn State. Like this kid, if he has all the potential that he had when he was a young prospect, he can hit. Um, but uh, this is going to be one that I think takes some time to play out. Uh, you love the frame. He's got some athleticism to boot. There's some things in that early tape that look really good. Um, you're just going to have to refine that and develop him, and it's going to be one of those ones where I have no idea how this one's going to turn out. Yeah, Ryan, w- what are your thoughts generally on, on TA and, and what um, <laughs> what he could do with some structure? What I'm trying to point to Sean, what he yeah, said. <laughs> I, I mean, by the way, th- m- that's much tougher than than people would think it is, pointing to the right <laughs> box. To it the, is the, so uh, hard. Yeah, so <laughs> oh. respect to those that can do it. it look, when, he, when those first ratings came out for this class, 24 7. I mean, uh, we uh, on three was just kind of getting started, but 24 7 had him like what top as a, as a like a five star? I mean, what was he like top 15 or top 10? I mean, there, there's a reason that his recruitment and, and the saga of it, uh, I don't want to say recruitment, his travels, I guess you'd say, uh, were so highly followed. I mean, you can you can Google uh, TA Cuttingham and, and everything that happened out in California and with him being uh, not suspended, but you know, not allowed to play because of transfer rules. Uh, and it, every major site wrote, I mean, ESPN wrote about it. The athletic wrote about it. Like this wasn't just like a recruiting site story. This was, uh, on all types of major, uh, sporting sites. So, uh, he's got all the potential or I mean, we think he has all the potential <laughs> if he yeah. can match what he, what he had as a, as a young player. Um, you know, it makes sense. The, the one other thing I will say just with TA real quick is like a couple years ago, I don't know if, if Penn state takes TA. Just and, and the reason I say that is because of the transfer portal, because of the the environment now, it, it makes it easier for them to take risk like this. Uh, because mm-hmm. if it doesn't work out, well, he'll probably just end up transferring out or something like that. So uh, I think just the, the portal, it's it's a popular topic, and you know how it impacts high school recruiting. But like in a lot of ways, the portal kind of helps TA uh, w- w- with Penn State. I think because it, it makes it easier for them to say, hey, you know, w- we saw his potential back in the day, like. The, this is probably a guy that we should we should take. Uh, Ron, I'm going to come back to you for the next position, linebackers. And I want to start with a guy that I know very little about. Um, obviously saw his junior film, but Kari Jackson. What can you tell us about Kari? Out injured. And and he hasn't talked to anybody since committing. <laughs> so I, I, All right. I wish, well. I, I, wish I could give more. <laughs> uh, I've reached out to Kari multiple times uh, to catch up with him because, you know, we know he missed uh, basically his entire senior year with an injury. I don't I still don't even know exactly what it was. I think it was a shoulder. I don't 100 percent have that. Yeah, I think that's what it was. But people basically have said, don't talk about it anyway. Anyway, uh, I, I think I, look, the one thing I'll say, <laughs> this is what I know about Kari Jackson. When he walked out of his last visit, which I think was with the whiteout game, I was like, oh, man, he's a good-looking prospect. And then I realized, oh, wait, that's Kari Jackson. Uh, so, I, look, he's got a lot of frame. He had a heck of a junior year. You know, always put up good stats. You know, he got some training down in IMG, came back to West Bloomfield. Um, there, there's there's a lot to like there, but uh, missing this year and just kind of uh, the information, which has been hard to gather, it makes it hard for me to, to really – sell him or, or or go all in on on you know why i think he's going to be a three-year starter or something like that uh we're going to go a little bit over time because we still got to get to the corners and safeties but a guy that we have to talk about obviously is anthony specka he's a guy who's a, a a leader in this group he's a guy that i know that has been uh one of the people that's been front facing one of the earliest commits in the class fits uh, where how do you feel about this linebacker group and how do you feel about specka um given you know penn state has been very successful at recruiting linebackers recently yeah, I think that's it's fair to say to look at this linebacker group and say that there's questions there. Are you bringing in two guys that profile as middle linebackers uh, in Specca in Jackson? Specca, of course, tremendously productive there at Central Catholic, one of the best programs in the state year in and year out. Um, but yeah, you look at what Penn State's done over the last couple of years, and it was oddly different. Like you thought that maybe they were able to try and add Elijah Newby to get a little bit more athletic in the outside. Now, granted, Dejon um, Lane 
could factor into this and eventually be a Sam guy. But uh, there's not a, ver- not a variety in terms of the linebacker class right now. Um, those guys, you put the film on, they'll, they'll hit you. That's for sure. Um, but I'm just curious how this uh, this translates into today's game. Now, Specca came to camp. Uh, he tested probably better than I think a lot of people thought that he might. Um, he's got some athletic ability. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how those two develop over the next couple of years and maybe three if you add Dejan Lane in that group. Yes, it's interesting that they both, as you mentioned, profile the same way. Uh, Great transition, fits excellent job. Dejan Lane, let's talk about him. I'm going to come back to you. Uh, What do you know about him and uh, what he can do for the Nittany Lions? Well, he's all over the field for Gilman. Gilman's not the same as it used to be uh, back when Biff was there, before they, you know, went off and did you know, founded St. Francis. All that, anyway, uh, he's been all over the place. Um, he's probably going to be on that line, sort of like a Dakari Nelson, where between safety and uh, and linebacker, depending on how he fills out, how he takes to the nutrition program, which is something sometimes we don't take into account here, how they take to the nutrition program, the strength program, and things like that. So be very interesting to see that, but he's an athletic kid, plays receiver, plays all over the field. Uh, Ford Gilman's done a really nice job with, uh, with, with that program down there. I believe we saw some times right around 11 seconds, so he can run, um, but uh, his development is going to be based on how he grows and how he fills out over the next couple of years. Like I said, could play that Sam, play a strong safety type, um, but uh, this is a guy that was one of my favorites early in the class, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot to like there. Yeah, and w- just one note on, on that with Tom Allen and his defense, that is still very much in play. Manny Diaz moving on doesn't change the fact that some of these safeties might end up at linebacker, Ryan. Um, your thoughts on Dejan Lane and then uh, start talking to us about uh, Vabu Torre and what these yeah. two guys can do together. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing that's interesting is like for pretty much Penn State's entire class, almost, almost all of them have tested somewhere, whether it's at Penn State or an Under Armour camp or wherever it may be. And and the two safeties are are – I think the only two guys are like, we don't really have any kind of testing numbers for uh, mm-hmm. with, you know, whether it be forties or, or, you know, whatever it may be shuttles, broad jumps. Uh, but I think like when I look at Vabu Torre, like, man, his film's fun. Like he, he is. is a striker, man. Like he hits, it, it's really kind of interesting. Kind of, I mean, is Jalen Reed a somewhat fair comparison? I mean, I, I, he certainly gets after it, has a nose for the ball. Uh, we'll, we'll see long-term as far as, uh, you know, how he does in pass coverage. Cause I, there's not a ton out there. Uh, of him really, uh, you know, decipher and watching a quarterback and, and and making great reads. Although, well, no, that's a run play there. I thought, I thought that was a pass play coming up, but um, you know, Torrey is just just an incredibly aggressive player. That that's what grabs my attention there. And then you know, Lane always had really good ball skills. That that was kind of the one thing we were able to see. But um, you know, as far as the kind of athletes they are and how they project long term, they're just they're, they're two guys that I've always just kind of wondered about. I'd love to get some testing numbers on them. Yeah, even from a film perspective, too, the guys uh, personally I know the least about just because, some, you know, with these guys and, and what Fitz said about Gilman, Lane didn't you know. talk to us for like ever. I got lucky <laughs> and somehow got him in July and was able to open up. But I mean, if Lane's done more than like three interviews his entire life, I'd be shocked. And as you said, I'm just going to quote you, Fitz, quoting uh, Dex. I like big safeties. So uh, both these guys definitely fit that profile. Uh, 200 pounds in high school, I think they're both listed at. So that kind of that fills out those guys. And, uh, you know, I, I think Fitz, they, they fit. This is the thing, and I'll, I'll rewind a little bit and, and kind of flesh out what I was my setup for you with the linebacker group is the, the threshold is so high at some of these positions that linebacker freaks uh, on the football field. And then you've got KJ Winston, Zaki Wheatley has a ton of talent. You have Jalen Reed. They have these guys that are just so like they set an almost unrealistic bar, it seems at times. So both these guys fit into that group, right? Like just because we don't have testing times on on them, they are still within that ballpark. Yeah, I think so. I think vabu has got to learn to play the position, and I think that's okay. probably going to take him a year or two. So, like, I, I don't look at this group and say that there's anybody that's going to break through. But then again, I, I look at Penn State safety group and say that there's no really room for them to break through. Right. Uh, Lane's going to be interesting to see whether he sticks at safety or if he goes to uh, uh, if he goes to linebacker. But that's those two position groups will play off of each other. Uh, Vabu's, like I said, he's, he's got to learn to play as an all around safety. And, uh, if you look at, I mean, he brings the wood, he definitely, he'll hit you, but there's a lot that there's a lot of holes there that he needs to fill out as well. So you look at the safety group and it's, uh, I think it's a long way from being finished. So let's, uh, transition then to the final group here, the corners. I think that, you know, the way that Penn state got these guys is, is interesting. It's fun. I know Fitz, you've been covering these guys and, and kind of focusing on them. So take us through John Mitchell and Antoine Belgrave shorter. 
Yeah, Mitchell and Belgrave Short are teammates at Mandarin who just lost in the state t- the state finals last weekend. Uh, really talented guys that, that I think both could probably push to play right away. I, I really thought that uh, – I really thought that um, – uh, sorry, I just got a text that I needed to attend to. I really <laughs> thought that Belgrave Shorter may be able to play right away based on the feedback that I've gotten. Then I watched John Mitchell's senior season highlights and uh, some of the, the tape that they were able to put together. That's a good player right there. <laughs> and it sort of reinvigorated my life. I was very high on John Mitchell early, sort of reinvigorated what I was thinking with that uh, right off the bat. So be curious to see. Hey, Penn State's got a need at corner, need, need these guys to step in. Will one of these guys take it up? Uh, I, I would... I would, I would, I would lean more yes than no. So I'm excited to see this development wow. uh, over the next uh, what eight, eight to twelve months. Uh, Ryan, you want to give us your thoughts here on this group, and and I guess from a from a stylistic standpoint, they fit very well into Manny Diaz's defense, right? That's no longer Manny Diaz's defense, but these guys still fit mm-hmm. into what Penn State is doing, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, they're I think they're incredibly well coached too. I mean, that's like the one thing that like multiple people have kind of brought up it's just like when they compare other high school programs other defensive backs like these two are are ahead of most others when it just comes to understanding the position that's in the technique and and the little things that that ultimately make a big difference between you uh registering your first year or, or you know maybe getting on the field a little bit so both of those guys absolutely are, are players we have circled for you know potential I don't think they're going to start or anything like that, but but could potentially play in eight games and you know maybe maybe a couple hundred snaps. And of course, Penn State's currently in the portal trying to find guys with experience at, at corner, so that that'll have an impact if they're able to get anybody in. But uh, I, one other guy I want to mention too, uh, we got to get Kenny Wellesley in there, of course, yep. from Imitap. One of Penn State's first commits in this class has been loyal, has been a great recruiter the entire time. And you know, everybody, every time I talk to somebody about Kenny, I think they start with like, you know, just something about him being a dog and how he gets after it all the time. And uh, you know, Kenny's uh, size wise and stuff, I think a lot of people always, you know, wonder at, at 5'10, you know, what is he, 170-ish? Like, obviously, he's gonna need some time to bulk up, but you know, six interceptions this year, uh, really made some awesome plays for Imitap and it's in a stack defense. Uh, and he's aggressive too, man. Like, like for his size, like he he he's not he's not scared to come up and hit you. Uh, we got to watch him, you know, play play some. I think I watched, yeah, I watched him twice this year against Spalding, and then of course in the championship game. So, uh, I, I have no doubts that Kenny Wellesley can play in this in, in this defense at some point. I just think he'll need a year or two to to thicken up a bit. A class of twenty twenty four, I think, is in the books, uh, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you being here and uh, and reviewing all of these commits for the Nittany Lions. Uh, and we'll see how they all fit uh, in the coming years. Um, any uh, quickly, if you want to, uh, anything coming up, Ryan, from you, bluewhiteillustrated.com. dot com. Well, because we're recording this tomorrow, signing day. So yeah, tune in now. I mean, obviously <laughs> Thursday, we'll we'll the portal. <laughs> When you after you guys are viewing this, uh, the portal comes back into focus Thursday and Friday, and and uh, we'll, we'll see where things go. Of course, with, with the bowl game coming up, that'll that'll take much of our attention uh, after Christmas. But uh, yep, still on portal watch. Still, uh, I'm not going to say any names because who knows what will happen by the time this airs. But uh, the the portal will still consume us for the for the coming weeks. Yeah, and by the way, uh, because of the portal, we're extending that signing day deal. The portal day coming up um, uh, tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, you know, we're talking in different timelines like this is a Back to the Future movie. But uh, Thursday, extending that deal, by the way, at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. Fitz, appreciate you being here, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I hope you have a great trip. I um, hope Ryan gets a nap. And uh, hopefully we see everybody from the YouTube channel on BlueWhiteIllustrated.com to talk a little bit about Penn State's class of 2025 because that's, uh, I guess, they're on the clock. It never ends. We will have all of that stuff and great coverage at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. I'm Thomas Frank, Sean Fitz, and Ryan Snyder. We will talk to you later.